testing on YouTube. Testing on YouTube. Testing on YouTube. Testing on YouTube. All right. Testing on YouTube. It's working on YouTube. How's it going, Majetti? 2ARX and the Big Fortuno. Let me close this out. All right, let me spit out this gum, take a sip of coffee. All right, we just have any second now it'll get started on X and then once that's ready to rumble then we're good to go let's go back to here the reason I pull up this image is because on X the f the thumbnail for X is basically the first frame of the video so that's why I have it on this all right let's make sure it's working Audio, is the audio working on X? Yeah, I think it's working. Okay, perfect. Let's go ahead and get started. All right, everybody, welcome to another Hoopo stream. Today we got a pretty cool paper for you guys. Uh, it's maybe a little bit older. It came out earlier this week. So all the kind of uh, YouTube videos and all the other people who make uh, kind of machine learning content, they already made the content for this paper. So maybe you've seen a couple of videos for this already, but we're of course gonna dive a little bit deeper, go into a little bit more about what this means, get a little bit more technical. So. Yeah, that's what we're going to do. We're going to be looking at the genie model. So, as I said, this is a very popular paper. Here is uh, Dr. Jim Fan. This is a original NVIDIA man who's quite famous in the machine learning space right now, but he called this my favorite paper in 2024 so far. So, high praise from Mr. Jim Fan. And actually, while I was trying to find this tweet, I found this, which was pretty cool. This is uh, Jim Fan was there when Elon got the original first NVIDIA chip that was delivered to OpenAI. So you can actually see here, this was the original NVIDIA hardware to Elon and the OpenAI team to the future of computing and humanity. And I present to you the world's first DGX-1. So this is way before the H100s, but here you see Jim Fan is one of the uh, people who got to sign that. And you can see Jensen Huang's signature there as well. Jensen, this guy here wearing his patented leather jacket. He's known for this look, but that's him right there. So I don't know. I thought that was kind of interesting, kind of paints a little bit more historical context to the whole situation that's happening right now where Elon is suing OpenAI, right? At one point... Elon was OpenAI. It was Elon and the OpenAI team. So kind of an interesting thing to think about there. How's it going, Umong? How's it going, Ed? Okay, but let's go back to the paper that we're going to be reading today. So the paper we're going to be looking at is a paper from Google DeepMind that came out on the 23rd of February, 2024. And this paper is called Genie or Generative Interactive Environments. So I guess generative and then the I stands for interactive, and then the E stands for environments. And uh, A Whole New World is kind of a play on a Disney movie in a Disney movie called Aladdin. I think there's a song called A Whole New World, but then basically in Aladdin, one of the main characters is this kind of genie who's kind of like a djinn. You know, he's kind of like a mythical creature from Arabic mythology, and uh, that's what the lamp kind of stands for. It stands for that genie. But... Uh, one of the one of the first things I'm going to talk about is that they call this a generative interactive environment, but really what this is is a world model, right? So they actually even reference this, but uh, related work here. So all the way down in page ten, they go into the related work section and they call this. Okay, 
we're calling this a generative interactive environment, but really it's what's known as a world model, which comes from this original Schmidt-Huber paper. So we're going to give Schmidt-Huber his credit. Uh, if you're not familiar with the Schmidt-Huber memes, this is kind of a guy from the same generation as like your Jan LeCun's, um, your Bengios, you know, your Jeff Hittens, those kind of like that level of uh, machine learning, that generation of machine learning people. But he's known specifically for being extremely petty when it comes to citing his work. So uh, I think it is important to note that they kind of got rid of his original terminology of calling this a world model. They called it something else, but they do reference his paper here. So this is the Schmidt-Huber paper, and this is a 2018 paper. How's it going in Pritam? So in this world model, I think the definition that they have here is probably the kind of cooler way to describe this, but it's an unsupervised manner to learn a compressed spatial and temporal representation of an environment. And once you have this compressed spatial and temporal representation of environment, you can start thinking about potentially training an agent, some kind of reinforcement learning policy, aka some kind of neural net, entirely inside of its own hallucinated dream generated by its world model. So in the 2018 paper, they're kind of doing this with these little like kind of toy environments. Here you have like kind of like a, a top-down view of like a little car, but the kind of core idea behind these world models is this idea of a compressed uh, state, right? So basically you're taking some kind of state of the world here. This is a two-dimensional image of the some kind of like uh, 3D environment. I think this is supposed to be like the Doom game. This is a very, very old video game where you basically move around in this like maze, but it's like a 3D maze, so it was kind of one of the first kind of 3D video games. But the idea with these world models is that they can compress all the information that's in this frame using an encoder, which is like some kind of neural net, and they compress it into this little Z. This little Z is basically just a vector of numbers or an embedding, or sometimes also called a latent. And that little embedding or latent is then fed into a different neural net called the decoder, which turns it back into an image, right? And this is basically an unsupervised type of uh, training. And unsupervised means that you don't need any extra stuff, right? So maybe you guys are familiar with bounding box detection or segmentation or any of these other types of supervised learning uh, approaches where you need to have some kind of supervision signal, right? Which is either some kind of box, like this is the box, or uh, this is the answer is effectively what you need, right? But there is no correct answer here, right? This is unsupervised in that the correct answer is the original image itself. So you can basically train it without having any kind of label or category or anything associated with that image other than just the image itself. So that's kind of the, the core idea behind uh, these world models is that they're basically just compressing the world into this little latent. And of course, in this Schmidt-Huber paper, it's kind of the simplest form of this, right? It's just a single frame. But uh, in this Genie paper, it's going to be a little bit more complicated because it's going to be a, a video, right? A whole sequence of frames, T frames, rather than just uh, a single frame and the way that they encode decode rather than using a convnet right this uh, schmidt huber paper is a 2018 paper so of course they're going to be using a convnet uh in this one they're going to be using a transformer right because it's a more modern paper but largely this genie paper is basically just the schmidt huber world model paper just kind of the modern version of that right it's just the modern version of the schmidt huber paper with transformers and a couple other little tricks uh which i think are there's a couple things in here that i found particularly interesting but, yeah, it's basically just the Schmidt-Huber paper, to be honest. Uh, yeah, let me scroll down to here, and then we'll go back to here, and then we'll kind of go into this introduction here. Uh, how's it going, J? We introduced Genie, the first generative interactive environment. Again, this is kind of... <laughs> a little bit contentious, right? Because they just created this new category called generative interactive environments, but really it's a world model. So it's not the first world model. So, you know, I don't know. I don't know about calling it the first something when it's really just something else. Trained in an unsupervised manner from unlabeled internet videos. And that's going to be kind of the key, 
magic that they kind of keep advertising here is that this is going to be entirely unsupervised and entirely unlabeled. But it's a little bit disingenuous because I think that the way that they're kind of filtering and controlling the distribution of these uh, internet videos is a type of inductive bias itself. So we'll see more what I'm talking about once we actually get into the action space, but it's a little bit, it's not as unsupervised and general as they kind of describe it. The model can be prompted to generate an endless variety of action controllable virtual worlds described through text, synthetic images, photographs, even sketches at 11 billion parameters, which is quite big. 11 billion parameters, kind of a little bit bigger than your 7B language models, which is kind of on the smaller end. But for some kind of like toy problem like this, it's a little bit big. Genie can be considered a foundation world model. Again, I would kind of push back a little bit on this. I don't think it's a foundation world model. I think it's a 2D video game world model, right? Foundation to me seems a little bit strong, right? Something like a stable diffusion, I would call that a foundation model, right? Because stable diffusion kind of encompasses any kind of, any semantic, like anything that you can just express in words, stable diffusion has some, can generate an image of that, right? So to me, the word foundation model should be something that is very, very, very broad, very, very generic. And this is not very, very broad and very generic, right? It's kind of very specific. It's really only for these types of 2D environments, these kind of side scrollers. So I wouldn't call that a foundation world model. I think it needs to be a little bit more general in order to call it a foundation world model. It is comprised of a spatiotemporal video tokenizer, an autoregressive dynamics model, and a simple and scalable latent action model. So the, those are the different pieces. We're gonna go into those as we go into this paper. Genie enables users to act in the generated environments on a frame-by-frame -frame basis, despite training without any ground truth action labels, which sounds pretty amazing. But again, I think that the way that they're uh, picking this data set and kind of constraining the, uh, the space of video to these specific kind of 2D side scrollers is why they're able to do this, right? Without having any ground truth action labels. Uh, other domain specific requirements typically found in the world model literature. Further, the resulting learned latent action space facilitates training agents to imitate behaviors from unseen videos, opening the path for training generalist agents of the future. And this is kind of what I mean by this is the Schmidt Huber paper all over again, because the Schmidt Huber paper is almost exactly the same as well, right? Where they basically create this world model. And then once they create this world model, the second half of the Schmidt Huber paper is basically using this world model to train. Uh, reinforcement learning policy that can take the correct action in this world model with some kind of behavior cloning. So it's effectively the same exact thing as the Schmidt-Huber paper where they train the world model and then once they have that world model, they show that this can be used for RL. So it's the more modern version of that. Uh, Jay doesn't have depth. This doesn't have like any explicit notion of death depth, right? It's trained on these 2D platformers, which are 2D. It does have some notion of depth later in the paper. For example, they, they show that there's this uh, parallax. So a lot of these like platformer games, there's not depth as in like a true depth, but there's this kind of like almost like layers, like you would see in some kind of compositing software where you have like the foreground and the background and then near and back background, right? So it, it understands some notion of like, this is the background, this is the foreground, but it's not, you can't actually use that type of information to do like any kind of 3D reconstruction, right? So it doesn't have that level of depth understanding. Yeah, okay. So let's get into it. Uh, we're going to kind of skip through some of this introduction here, get to here. The data set that they're going to be training on is 200,000 hours of publicly available internet gaming videos that don't have actions or text annotations. And what do they mean by that? Is that there is no explicit action, right? So in a lot of these world model type papers or any kind of Atari reinforcement learning paper, usually for every single state transition, right? So for every pair of images where you have, here's image A and then here's image B, usually there's an associated action with that, right? So because you've collected a data set from some kind of Atari game engine, you know, hey, this is where it was before, this is the button that I clicked, right? Or like the left arrow is what I clicked at this specific point in time, and then it went to the next frame, and that's the frame that came after. So what they're trying to kind of 
really showcase here is that they don't need that. They don't need that action or text annotation where the text annotation might be information about what's going on, right? The only thing they have is just these frame by frame, here's frame one, here's frame two. And the only thing that we know, the only inductive bias there is that we know that frame two happened after frame one, but we don't know what action was clicked. We don't even know if an action was clicked, right? There might be no action in between that. And that's why what they're going to have to do is they're going to have to learn this action space, right? So a, an explicit action space would be you as the designer come in and you say, okay, here are all the different actions that you can take, right? In an Atari game, there's some limited amount of buttons, right? Up, down, left, right, A, B, whatever, uh, bumpers, right? And you say, here are the four possible or the 10 possible actions. And that would be kind of an explicit uh, action space, right? Which most of the time, that's what people are going to do, right? They're going to kind of bake in that bias of like, here's the action space. And here, they're not going to do that. They're going to learn a latent action space. And the entire paper, they kind of try to sh say that this is like really amazing, you know, and like, wow, we're learning this latent action space. Like, look at that. That's completely revolutionary. But I kind of keep wanting to repeat that it's really not as impressive as they think it is because they're constraining the data set distribution to this very, very narrow uh, part that is 2D platformers, right? So is that really, are you really learning a latent space that is generalizable across all video environments? Not really, right? Like you're just learning up, down, left, right, A, then like jump button, right? Almost every single 2D platformer has kind of largely the same exact action space. So if you're selecting your data set, to a specific niche, such as 2D platformers, which have almost identical action spaces, then getting rid of the saying that you have this learned generalist action space is a little bit misleading, right? Because it's 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 already super constrained, which is why you're able to learn it. Okay, so that that's kind of like the main thing I don't like about this paper. But overall, it's a pretty well written paper, and it's a pretty cool uh, demo. So, you know, it's hard to shit on this paper, but that one part of it kind of just like peeves me where they kind of like pretend that learning a latent action space is amazing when it's like, it's the same, it's the same environment every time. Okay. So they're going to have a couple different components here. They're going to have a spatial temporal transformer. This is, uh, I looked up this reference, but it's kind of not super important. This is exactly the type of transformer they use. The type of transformer they use comes from this 2021 paper called Spatial Temporal Transformer Networks for Traffic Flow Forecasting. So like literally forecasting the flow of traffic, um, which is like some random paper, you know, but this is the specific type of transformer that they use. There's, we're seeing a bunch of different types of innovations, right? So within the tr transformer architecture space, right? the simplest forms of these that you see is these vision transformers, right? Which we've shown time and time again on these streams where basically you're taking a transformer, which is a sequence to sequence model. And in order to feed it uh, two dimensional data, such as this image, you're patchifying it or cutting up, cutting it up into these little patches and then feeding that as a sequence. So there's a lot of different variants of that. As soon as you introduce the concept of basically now, it's not just X and Y, you're also introducing this notion of time. So you have a series T, a sequence of T frames, right? Which each frame has some H and W. You basically, the way that you do that, there's a lot of different ways of doing that. And of course, Sora has its own way of doing that. There's a a bunch of different ways. And I don't think this is the end of it, right? So that's kind of the reason why I don't think it's necessarily worth focusing too much on the spatial temporal transformers, because that's just the one that they kind of happen to use for this paper. But I bet you that a year from now, people are going to use a different type of transformer. They might not, they might even use something that's a little bit more like a Mamba, right? Like a recurrent kind of pattern, which is actually what Schmidt Huber uses in his paper. So in the Schmidt Huber paper, right? This is, they use a convnet for the encoder decoder. And then the model that kind of does the uh, actual, I guess the world model part of it uh, is a RNN. So it's kind of a recurrent neural network, which is kind of like a Mamba. And it's kind of weird describing an RNN as a Mamba because a lot the way that a lot of people describe Mamba models is as RNNs. So RNN, you could think of it like a kind of an earlier version of a Mamba. It's basically a state space model that kind of keeps passing this hidden state, this HT minus one, HT, HT plus ones, right? There's this hidden little vector that represents uh, 
uh, the, the state of the world, and that is being consumed by the RNN at this state, and then it, per, you, it also takes this action and this Z of T here. So the action is the action, right? Like the left button, right button, and that's kind of the, one of the main differences here, right? Is that in this one, they don't use without the action or text annotation. So if we actually go to the, to the world model, where is it over here? Let's go here. You see this dynamics model is consuming the action and the Z, Z is the state space. I, I think I'm getting a little bit too ahead. Let's, let's, let's go back. I'm getting a little bit too ahead. Okay. Uh, so they're using this spatial temporal transformer, uh, which extracts latent actions via a causal att action model, a dynamics model, which autoregressively predicts the next frame using mask GIT scaling analysis of our architecture. So, this paper is well-written, and one of the things that makes it well-written is that they kind of don't just present results for one model size. They try a variety of different batches and model sizes, so you can kind of see how the scaling works. Uh, they also filter down the data set, so this is an interesting part of this paper as well, where rather than the original 200,000 hours of internet gaming videos, they actually filter that down to 30,000 hours of internet gameplay videos. They describe that in the appendix section here, the uh, different steps that they did to do that. So why don't we take a little uh, break here to see exactly what they're doing. So here in the appendix section, the initial data set is based on internet videos and this being a Google DeepMind paper that basically means YouTube. So they go on YouTube and they uh, search for any video related to 2D platformer games, right? So already this is an extremely hard filter, right? Think about all of YouTube. And if you were if you were to train something like this on all of YouTube, that would be an actual foundation world model, right? But the fact that they're all, that they're filtering it down to only specific 2D platformer games, that's why I have a hard time calling this a foundational world model. To me, it's a very specific type of world model that's only for these types of uh, games. Uh, the title of the description contains an action or a word, such as speedrunner playthrough. The title must not contain negative words, such as movie. They manually spot check the results, so they go through and they see what they got. They're looking at 16 second clips at 10 FPS. Then they go ahead and they filter these. So they notice that many of the videos were of poor quality, so they filter the data set using a learned classifier. So what does that mean? That means that they're going to hand label 10,000 videos, so they're going to basically go through 10,000 videos from this original data set, and they're going to label them as either five, which is good, or one, which is bad, right? So they, they kind of, they want to pick 16 second clips that don't contain menu screens or don't have uh, a streamer face in the bottom, like right here, like you're watching a video right here and you see how my face is right here. That would confuse it, right? They, they just want very clean, two-dimensional picture of the video game being played and then subsequent frames where nothing happens, right? It doesn't cut to some B-roll or anything like that. It just uh, is the pure video game itself, this 2D platformer. So they hand label about 10,000 of these, train a binary classifier. Binary classifier is effectively your hot dog, not hot dog kind of situation, right? And except in this case, it's saying good quality data, bad quality data. They train a little ResNet 18, which is a little old, uh, residual network, kind of like a convnet, with 11 million parameters, and then they basically just filter through the original 55 million videos or 244k hours, and uh, boil it down into this curated data set, which is just over 10% the size of the original data set. And the interesting thing here is that uh, this FVD is a metric that they use. This is a Frisch video distance. We'll go into that later, but. I thought this was an interesting table here where even with a curated data set that is 10% the size of the original data set, they do get better performance. So this isn't, you know, we know that data set curation matters, but you know, this should be a little bit weird, right? Cause it's like most of you are kind of in this narrative of like, if you can 10 X the amount of data, it'll perform better, right? So here you have a, a, a situation where reducing the data set by a factor of 10 through filtering via this binary classification improves performance. But the important thing to realize here is that this is a very specific kind of narrow task, right? So because this is so limited to 2D platformer games and they have so many different 
things that are specific to these kind of 2D platformers, it makes sense that heavy filtering to the point that you're using one-tenth of the original size will improve performance. And even the performance improvement, which is here demonstrated via FVD, I don't actually think FVD is a very good metric for other reasons. So this isn't necessarily a proof point that uh, more data isn't always good. I think more data is always good, but I think to me this is more a proof point that data set curation is very important, especially if you're in a very narrow specific domain like this, uh, such as 2D platformer games. Okay, so let's go back here. Okay, so they have these couple different models that we'll go into. They're largely training this on a bunch of internet videos which they filtered. And they're also going to evaluate this on the RT1. This is the robotic transformer, uh, which is actually an older generation of this. I think we've we read the original RT1 data set on a stream, but then there was also RT2, and I think now there's RTX as well. So this is a little bit of an older version of the robotic transformer data set from Google, which looks a little bit like this, right? So this is like the view of like a hand little robotic hand that's grabbing things from a table. So this is what the RT2 data set looks like. And again, even though this is pretty, this is different, right? This robot is very different from a 2D platformer environment, right? So they're trying to make the argument that, okay, because we can train this on 2D platformers and then look at that, the same kind of system works for robotics. Therefore, this shows that it's basically a generalist world foundation world model. But I would go back to my point that the action space for this robot is also very similar to the action space for this, right? It's still a very limited action space, such as in a little two-dimensional platformer, you have up, down, left, right. You have those same movements here, right? So you have up, down, left, right for this robot as well. So the action space for both of these types of domains is more similar and they're not necessarily acknowledging that, right? They're pretending that it's a very different type of problem when really the the actions, the action space is kind of the same. But the counter argument to what I'm saying is that what percentage of all the different problems in the world have a very similar action space, right? Can you can you use something that just knows up, up down, left, right, jump? Can you use that in environment, like how many environments can be described by that? And actually it could be the case that a huge amount of environments could be described by that. Uh, question from what kind of traffic? Okay, so 87 is asking about this paper. I'm not entirely sure. I think this is intelligent transportation system. So this is probably like I don't know, traffic in a city or something like that. I haven't actually read this paper. But maybe they describe it here. Let's see. Accurate traffic forecasting. Intelligent transportation. Efficient urban traffic controlling. So it's basically a, some kind of data set of like car number of cars at intersections or something like that, right? And the key thing here is that there's some spatial and then there's temporal. So the spatial in this case might be the different intersections in a city. And then the temporal component of this is uh, the notion of time over the course of a day or over the course of a month or something like that, right? So this is intersection one in the morning, intersection one in the afternoon, and so on. Okay. Architecture fairly standard. Okay. All right, let's go back to the paper. Uh, latent actions learned from internet videos can be used for inferring policies from unseen action-free videos of simulated reinforcement learning environments. So they're going to be using uh, this model, which can basically guess the action that you took in between two different frames or two different videos to get basically the actions of videos that are not labeled. Genie may hold the key to unlocking l unlimited data for training the next generation of generalist agents. And this is why people like Jim Fan are excited about this, right? Where reinforcement learning is very uh, data hungry, right? You need a huge amount of examples of interaction with an, with an environment. In robotics, the way that most people try to solve this is using simulations. But simulators, you know, there's all kinds of problems with that. They're really not 
super perfect to the real world. There's tons of techniques that you can do to fight that, but a very uh, a very simple way that we could solve all of that, at least a simple in terms of like the high level design, is hey, if you could just create a world model that can consume actions and then give you the next state, you could then train a reinforcement learning agent in that world model, right? So if we can create these kind of foundation world models, then we can basically train foundational agents in those world models. But I actually like the way that they say this in the Schmidt-Huber paper better. So in the Schmidt-Huber paper, the way that they say this is quite badass is we can train our agent entirely inside of its own hallucinated dream generated by its world model. This is almost like <laughs> religious statement, you know, because if, if you're into like simulation theory, this might be what we're doing, right? This kind of idea of like your life is just a dream and the whole point of life is to basically grow a soul and the way that you grow a soul or train an agent is by performing in a, in a world, which is dreamed. So I don't know. There's, I, I just love the way that they say this, the hallucinated dream generated by its world model. Certainly more flowery language than they say here, but it's basically the same idea. Okay. Uh, a new class of generative model. Genie is a novel world model that is controlled on a frame-by-frame -frame basis, which requires only video data. Right. So here they're basically saying, okay, we don't have this action right? We only have videos. We don't actually know what button someone clicked in between the frames. We only have the frames. <laughs> okay. Uh, several components in the Genie architecture are based on the vision transformer. Uh, specifically, the type of vision transformer that they're going to be using is this memory efficient ST transformer, uh, spatiotemporal transformer, which is you could think of it like a VIT that has this uh, time dimension as well as the spatial dimension. Uh, unlike a traditional transformer where every token attends to all the others, the SD transformer contains L spatial temporal blocks interleaved with spatial and temporal attention layers. So basically what's happening here is if we go to this spatial temporal transformer paper, you see how here uh, you have first spatial temporal block, second spatial temporal block. So any transformer-based model is basically this concatenation of these blocks. These are called transformer blocks. You have your multi-head attention, and then you have a little feed-forward network or MLP here, and then you'll basically just stack a bunch of these blocks on top of each other. So in this paper, basically, they each block contains a spatial component and a temporal component. And this graph here is a little bit hard to read. So I actually think this one makes a better uh, example. So the SD transformer architecture, the architecture is composed of L spatial temporal blocks. So you see L number of these stacked on top of each other, each containing a spatial layer, a temporal layer, and a feed forward layer. So the spatial and the temporal layer are the attention mechanism. And then the feed forward layer is uh, this part here, right? This little MLP here. So each color represents a single self-attention map with the spatial layer attending over the H by W tokens from within the single time step and this temporal, the same token from across T time steps. Okay, so basically the the way that this spatio-temporal transformer works is you see here there's spatial attention. So these three colors here mean that everything here is in the same multi-head attention, right? So basically what's happening here is that each of these squares represents an image, right? So you have an image with some width and some height. And then you have, it's a video, which means that there's a sequence of these images. So T time steps. And for each time step, you have an image. And the spatial part of this spatial temporal transformer is basically letting every token in the single frame or the spatial information, spatial part of this, right? Within a single frame, all the tokens pay attention to each other. So that's the spatial. And then within all the frames, so within basically this, the dimension of time, you can see how this token here and the same position of that token in the next frame and the same position of that token in the next frame are here, they're paying attention in the temporal dimension, right? So you basically have a self-attention between in each frame where every token in that frame is paying attention to each other. And then you have this temporal attention where across the whole video, the same token in every single frame is paying attention to itself, right? So that's basically uh, how they're consuming a video with a transformer. Okay. Uh, our architecture scales linear with the number of frames rather than quadratically. So the 
transformers generally are quadratic with respect to the sequence length. So normally, everything needs to pay attention to everything. So as you increase the everything or the size of the input sequence, your memory is going to increase quadratically. But because here, notice that the attention is only between the 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 stuff within the frame and then the same token within the whole sequence. So you notice here, for example, that this token here never pays attention to this token here, right? So you're never actually doing the full self-attention where every single token at every single frame is paying attention to every single other token at every single frame, right? You're actually limiting that. You're putting a little bit of inductive bias here and you're saying, okay, uh, each token will only pay attention to the other tokens within its own frame, and then it'll pay attention to the other tokens that are in the same position in the temporal dimension. So they're kind of getting rid of the potential uh, attention that could happen between a token that's in a different position in one frame and a token that's in a different position in a different frame. So by getting rid of that particular type of attention, aka separating out the kind of temporal or time-based attention and the spatial or kind of like uh, interframe attention. By doing that, they can basically get linearly with the number of frames rather than quadratically. So they get a little bit of a boost there, but this is the type of hack that I feel like it's just going to go away, right? Like the, the reason they have that hack is because they need to actually train this and they don't have the number of TPUs and the TPUs themselves don't have the memory required to do this in a full inductive bias free where everything is paying attention to everything. But you can bet that two years from now, someone will get rid of this type of inductive bias, which comes from this ST transformer and they'll probably get better results. So that's the, uh, spatial temporal transformer. Okay. Uh, what else? The model components. Okay. So the main model components here are going to be a latent action model, a video tokenizer and a dynamics model. Uh, the model is trained following a two phases. You have your standard autoregressive video generation pipeline. We train the video tokenizer first, which is used for the dynamics model. We then co-train the latent action model directly from pixels and the dynamics model on video tokens. So the first thing that they're gonna do is they're gonna train this video tokenizer. So the video tokenizer is gonna be trained. Do they have a video for that? Or do they have a figure for that? They. Yeah, here you go. Here's how they train the video tokenizer. So the video tokenizer is basically just going to consume a sequence of these tokens, X1 to T here, right? Tokens are these things here. They're little chunks of images. Here's another picture of what a token looks like. It just looks like that, right? But as you go up through the transformer blocks, these tokens aren't going to look like little image chunks anymore. They're just going to be some vector that's not, you can't really understand what that is as a human, but it's like some vector that represents what's in that little patch. Uh, yeah, so this video tokenizer, the way that they train it is they basically do a standard kind of reconstruction here where they're basically saying, here's the video, we're going to compress it with our spatial temporal transformer into this sequence of tokens, and then we're going to have a decoder, which consumes that little sequence of tokens and tries to reconstruct the full image. So the one interesting thing that they do here for this video tokenizer is that they actually use a VQVAE rather than a VAE. So, uh, video tokenizer. Following prior work, we compress videos into discrete tokens, right? The discrete is this VQ. So, a VAE is not discrete. A VQVAE is discrete. So, here's a, another way to understand that. In this Schmidt-Huber paper, they don't use a VQVAE. They use a VAE, right? So, they just use a standard VAE. In a standard VAE, right, this Z right here is... A continuous little vector, right? And what does that mean? It means that this is think about each of these little sliders as basically one of the call one of the rows of this little vector, right? So this is the latent vector Z or the uh, hidden space or whatever you want to call it, embedding. And in this Z, right, I can continuously change the value of this. So notice how like whenever I slide this, the world changes, right? So the the late the Z here is representing the state of the world. The, this little vector here, which is a continuous vector, I can change values of it co continuously and just interpolate and and look at that. Like you see, we're kind of like there's this one seems to be left and right. So there's some notion of like certain dimensions kind of encode for different things, but right. The key part here is that it's a it's a full continuous vector. Uh, 
In this paper, they're using a VQVAE. The VQVAE comes from this paper here. This is neural discrete representation learning. So if you think about this thing here, this Z as a representation, this is a continuous representation. But in this paper, they were like, what if we make that discrete? So rather than being a continuous vector, let's have a code book or specific dictionary of these hard, like they're not hard coded, you learn them too, but uh, the, the latent representations can only take specific discrete values. Okay. Vector quantized variational autoencoder differs from VAE in two key ways. The encoder neural network outputs discrete rather than continuous codes. So this is continuous, right? I can take any value here. There's like an infinite number of values for Z here versus here it's discrete. And the prior is learnt rather than static. Okay, so the I thought that the motivation in this VQVAE paper is a little bit interesting. So uh, we concatenate on dis or we concentrate on discrete representations, which are potentially a more natural fit for many of the modalities we are interested in. Language is inherently discrete. Similarly, speech is typically represented as a sequence of symbols. Okay, so that seems pretty like that's a pretty obvious thing for us now because we use transformers and transformers we uh, use them with these uh, tokenized. Uh, sentences where the sentences are broken up into these little tokens and we basically we already are thinking in this way of like okay well language is discretized there's a limited there's a limited set of letters there's a limited set of tokens that you can use to communicate things with language right but the more interesting thing that they think about here is that maybe you take that one step further and you say okay well not only is language tokenized but if language is tokenized or discrete then maybe discrete representations are a natural fit for more complex reasoning, planning, and predictive learning, right? So that idea of planning there, right? So if you in your head, when you think about what you want to do, the way that they say you do it here is that you're using, you're talking in your head. So the way that you plan and decide and reason in your head, if you're doing it in language, that means you're doing it in a discrete, discretized space, right? I would argue that not quite, right? I think that your brain, like at least if you're learning kind of, if, if you're doing planning visually and reasoning visually, it might not actually be discrete. You might actually be planning in kind of a more continuous space like this. But I thought that this was a kind of an interesting way to think about it where, hey, if we as humans, or at least some part of us think in language and are planning in language using our kind of internal, our internal voice, then maybe, uh, planning is better off being done in a discrete space. I don't know. I thought that was kind of cool. Okay. Uh, so now let's actually scroll down to the picture here so you guys can kind of understand exactly what's going on. Here we have the VQVAE. So you notice this is just the same kind of encoder decoder. You have an encoder, which is a neural net here. It's a CNN convnet, right? Because this is a older paper, 2018 paper, 2017 paper. So the encoder consumes an image, turns it into this latent vector Z, right? That latent vector Z is basically uh, you, you, kind of like a nearest neighbor type thing. So here's the actual space, right? So whenever you take your image and you, comp and you basically project it into this latent space, you're going to get this little green dot right? That little green dot represents some kind of continuous point in a continuous space, right? So in order to discretize it, you're going to have to say, okay, well, rather than this green dot there, we're going to just pick the nearest vector or the nearest point that is in our uh, code book. So this code book here, you see how there's E1, E2, E3, up to EK. There's a limited set of those, right? So you decided, okay, we're going to have 30,000 possible discrete uh, uh, points in this embedding space. And anytime our encoder projects into something, we're going to basically go to the nearest one and say, use that instead. Right? Uh, here. And then you, then you feed that back to the decoder and you reconstruct it. Right? So you're basically taking a VAE and forcing it to be uh, quantized, aka forcing it to be discrete, forcing it to be uh, one of the limited set of vectors that you have here in this embedding space. And this isn't learned, right? So it's not like you're basically uh, choosing this beforehand. 
you're like learning this over time, right? So basically the gradient will eventually kind of like shape and morph and you'll eventually end up picking uh, a code book or learning a code book that is uh, useful for whatever this. Here in this case, they're reconstructing ConvNet images of probably something like ImageNet if I had to guess, but uh, in this one, these, I don't, I don't exactly know I think the VQVAE is used for the video tokenizers. So the video tokens that you're gonna end up here are probably gonna have like different, you know, it's, I, I don't know, read into it as you will, right? So this, the, this is creating some discrete space that represents the video, what each of the discrete things necessarily mean. They probably have some kind of semantic-y interpretation, like, oh, this is like s slightly uh, darker things, slightly lighter things. This represents platforms. This represents uh, when the person is jumping, not jumping. So you could probably like double click and like look into this uh, discretized space here, this code book, and kind of like interpret some of it. But it's going to be hard as a human to really understand what that is. I do have one GIF here just to show you guys, this is a GIF of a vector quantization process, just to kind of drive home this idea of like, you have a continuous space here. This is a two dimensional space. And you can see how, for example, if you were to uh, sample a point here, you would basically just pick the nearest one. So each of these red dots would represent the actual values of the vectors that you would have in your code book. And then this is how you go from kind of a continuous vector, which is going to come out of your encoder, and then pick the appropriate uh, vector in your codebook. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. I don't know. Sometimes I feel like I don't explain things super clearly, but that's what the difference between a VQVAE and a VAE is. And they're going to be using the VQVAE for their video tokenizer. Uh, the tokenizer is trained using the standard VQVAE objective. And here's your video tokenizer. Uh, okay. So that's the video tokenizer. The next kind of important thing is going to be this uh, latent action model. So the video tokenizer, they're going to train that one first. And the, it's basically going to allow them to take any video and turn it into a sequence of tokens. So what the latent action model is going to do now is uh, condition each future frame prediction on the action taken at the previous frame. However, such action labels are rarely available on videos on the internet. So they're basically saying that m most videos on the internet, you don't actually know what the person clicked, right? Especially these kind of 2D platformers. It's not like you can basically scrape that video and say, okay, in between frame number 700 and frame number 701, was the user clicking the left arrow or the right arrow? You don't actually know, right? So you don't have that uh, annotation of an action for each frame or state transition. So they're going to learn the latent actions. So first you're going to take, uh, also can be a VQVAE. So they used a VQVAE for the video tokenizer. They're going to use a VQVAE for this latent action model. The VQVAE for the video tokenizer consumes the whole video, turns it into the sequence of tokens, and then outputs, or, and then the decoder reconstructs. So you just have a kind of a reconstruction loss going on here. The latent action model is a little bit weirder it basically consumes all the uh x1 to t is the video tokens up until time step t and then you have the xt plus one that's the next video token so you basically have all the video tokens up until some point and then the next video token and then your late uh latent action model encoder is going to basically compress this down to a single action but it's not even an action like a one hot right so most of the time in reinforcement learning papers where you have an explicit action space, right? And everything is labeled with these or annotated with these explicit actions. The action space is going to be like a one hot vector where you're like, this is left button, which is one zero zero or right button, which is zero one zero or down button, which is zero zero one. Right. But in this case, right, that's not what you're learning. You're learning these kind of latent actions, which are just going to be vectors, which are just going to basically be these type of things they are going to be these red dots, right? They're going to be these little discrete points in this uh, giant embedding space that represent all the actions, right? And then your decoder, your decoder is not just consuming that action. It's consuming all of the X, all of the video frames up until one to T. 
and then it's also consuming this action, and then the video or the latent action model decoder tries to reproduce the next frame. So you see here how this encoder, it has xt plus one, the decoder is trying to recreate xt plus one given a of t and x1 up to t. So the, the latent action model encoder basically consumes the entire video and it tries to predict the action of the last frame. And the decoder consumes all the video up until that last frame. It consumes the action token that's coming out of this encoder, right? Which is some set of limit, one of a uh, code book of different actions. And then it's gonna consume the entire video up until that last frame, and then it tries to predict that last frame, and then this is where your actual uh, loss is gonna come in, where now you can actually uh, use a reconstruction loss to say, okay, this x bar, x hat t plus one, which is being predicted by the decoder, should match this x t plus one. So same thing as kind of a standard encoder decoder here, you're using this reconstruction, except here you're reconstructing that last frame. Okay. Uh, Actions T, unsupervised from unlabeled video frames, right? Unsupervised because you don't need any kind of supervision signal. You don't need annotations. You don't need to know what the action was. You're basically just doing everything in this VQ codebook of actions. The entire LAM is discarded and replaced with actions from the user. Okay. And maybe do I, do I go into my rant again? The rant that I already gave you guys twice? So he's the, here's the rant that I already gave you guys twice, and I'm gonna give it you guys a third time. This action, these latent action models, it's not impressive because the action space is already so constrained, right? If the only thing you're training this on is like a huge amount of 2D platformers, right? Filtered 2D, 2D platformers that don't have any menu screens or anything, so it's just like exclusively these kind of like side scroller type games pretty much every single one of these side scroller games has the same action space up down left right jump right so if you train a vq vae that tries to get this code book of possible actions right of course it's going to come up with left right up down jump right so like it's kind of like you, 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 they're getting rid of the inductive bias, but then they're putting that inductive bias in the data set so that it, this action space here, this A of T, right, it's gonna be very, very simple for the right answer to just kind of fall into place, right? Because there's really only f like whatever, five clusters here of up, down, left, right, jump, and everything in your data set has the same action space. So it's kind of like you're, you can't help it. You're kind of like constraining this VQVAE to such a limited, uh, set that the, the only vocabulary that makes sense is the vocabulary that you could have just baked in as an inductive bias at the very beginning. So it's a little bit cheating. You know, I think of that if you had a much more complicated data set where not everything was just two dimensional up, up, down, left, right, you know, imagine much more complicated kind of like people dancing or like a first person view of a drone, like racing through a forest, right? Like if you fed that that type of data distribution into this latent action uh, encoder decoder, I don't think that you would get the kind of cleanliness that they had here, right? That's So I think we still have a couple things to fix before we can really call this a foundational world model. Okay. Uh, Question from Pratyush. Can we discuss why we need the whole sequence of frames? Won't the last frame and the next frame suffice to give latent space? Yeah, you're not wrong, right? You're basically saying that, hey, in most of these video games, like you don't necessarily need the, the, the entire sequence of frames, but they're not really using that many frames to begin with, right? So I think like largely... Let's see if we can actually get to the numbers here. They're only using like, uh, yeah, a sequence length of 16 frames. So they're only using 16 frames. So it's like basically just like, th that's, not a, that's not a lot at all. You know, it's not like they're using like a huge, like even the, even the one minute video of Sora, right? The tokenization of that is much more intense than the tokenization here, which is just 16 time steps. 
right? So it's basically like 16 pictures. And especially in this type of thing where you can, like if I give you just two frames, the last two frames, you could probably get the same results, right? Even with just two frames, imagine just, because two frames allows you to say, okay, the character is moving up, the character is moving left, the character is moving right. So, yeah. So as Jay said, just two frames, it would probably work just as well. Okay. Uh, so that's the latent action model. We looked at the video tokenizer, and I think there's one more piece left here. So the last part here is what they call the dynamics model. Okay, so the we looked at the latent action model, which is basically a VQVAE that allows you, or that creates this code book of actions. You have the video tokenizer, which is a VQVAE, which allows you to take any video and turn it into these video tokens. And now they're going to have this dynamics model, this red part here. This dynamics model, let's scroll to the section where they describe it. The dynamics model takes in video to tokens and action embeddings and predicts future masked video tokens. Okay, so the dynamics model takes uh, Z, which is the uh, tokens of video, aka some kind of like vector that represents this specific token in the video. You can see how there's a sequence of those all the way from one to T minus one, time T minus one, one is the very beginning. So this would probably be uh, frame zero all the way to frame 15 or 16. And then here you're trying to predict frame 17. And this would be all the actions from frame zero all the way to frame uh, 16. And then you're I guess you're not predicting the action here. You're just only predicting the next frame or the next token, right? So it's not even predicting the full image. It's predicting like the, the video token that represents that. Uh, the dynamics model is a decoder only mask GIT. The mask here, so they keep saying this masked video tokens. What they're referring to is that in autoregressive transformers, usually you put a mask such that you can uh, kind of only predict from the next thing. Let's see if I can find a picture of that. I should have pulled up. Masked uh, transformers. But kind of the simplest way to understand that is that you're kind of like blocking out certain parts of it. Yeah, like you can mask, aka means that you're removing that, so you're not letting the model look at those tokens whenever it does the attention. And uh, every like right, if you could look at all the tokens every time, then you could kind of cheat by looking ahead a little bit. So this type of masking is done to prevent that. Uh, at each time step, T, one to T, it takes in the tokenized video, stop grad latent actions, stop grad there means they're not pushing gradients into it, and predicts the next frame token. The model is trained with a cross entropy loss between the predicted tokens and the ground truth tokens. So cross entropy loss is your standard classification loss, right? It's basically, there's a limited set of, of classes and you're basically predicting the probability of the next token being one of those. And in this case, right, rather than necessarily predicting the next token where the token is some chunk of a sentence where that chunk of the sentence is one of 30,000 possible tokens, here, the, the space that you're predicting is this discretized video token space where there's some limited code book of video tokens, and you basically are using cross entropy to pick the right video token. So you're trying to pick the right video token for the next frame. Uh, they randomly mask the input token, so they're basically adding a little bit of regularization here where even though they're feeding in 16 uh, frames, right, they're masking out some of the tokens randomly, so the dynamics model here, when it's being trained, it's being trained with a bunch of empty spots randomly, right? So it's kind of like, it's just a type of regularization where it forces it to kind of pay a little bit more attention to everything, right? Especially because you could envision that this type of dynamics model would probably learn to kind of ignore everything in the beginning, right? Especially for something like a two-dimensional platformer, as we were discussing, where only the last two frames, you would probably be able to do most of it with the last two frames. So by doing this uh, random masking, which you can kind of think of it like, like dropout, but in the time uh, dimension, it's going to force it to kind of pay attention to the entire sequence of video tokens as opposed to just the last couple of uh, video tokens. So it's kind of like dropout, basically. Okay, this is... So now this is one part of the paper that was like a sleeper, kind of like they just hit you with it, and they talk about it for one second here, but this is actually 
one of the more kind of weird shit that they did that I thought was really interesting. So note that a common practice for training world models, including transformer based models is to concatenate the action at time T to the corresponding frame. Okay. What do they mean by that? So you see how this dynamics model here, it's consuming this Z one to T and it's consuming this a one to T and you see how these little blue things and these little yellow things, most of the time when people are feeding, uh, some kind of like, uh, image information and then the action information, they're, they're concatenating that. What that means is that maybe this little Z of T here, it, or the Z1 here is like a, a hundred dimensional vector. And then this A is like a 10 dimensional vector, right? So what most people would do is that, okay, the dynamics model is going to consume something, a little vector that's just the concatenated version of both of those, right? So it's going to consume a vector that's 110, where the first 100 dimensions are this Z and then the next 10 dimensions are this A. But what they do in this paper is they add them, which is fucking weird. However, we found that treating the latent actions as additive embeddings for both the latent actions and dynamics models helped to improve the controllability of the generations. So what that means is that this little picture here is actually misleading because first thing I thought of is like, wait a second, how can you add them? The dimensionality of this Z is going to be different than the dimensionality of this A, right? Like how, how would that even work? But then I went all the way down to the appendix section and look at this. So the action model, right? The code book for the action model. So in that code book, there's only 32 or there's eight possible codes, which is kind of what I'm saying by the cheating. It's like left, right, up, down, jump, and then bumper, whatever the other buttons are, right? So there's only eight codes or another way to think about it is if we go back to this uh, VQVAE, you see this embedding space, it's quantized to specifically eight of these. But the important part here is that the dimension of each of those is a 32. So there's eight possible latent actions, which have a dimension of 32. And if we go down to the video tokenizer, the video tokenizer, which is also a VQVAE, this one has a lot more. So the dictionary here is a lot bigger. It's 10,024 or 1,024 possible uh, latents, latent codes. But look at this, the latent dimension is also 32. So that's why they can do this because the latent dimension for the video tokenizer is also a little 32 dimensional vector. So the video tokenizer is tokenizing into 32 dimensional vectors. And then the action model is also tokenizing into 32 dimensional vectors. So what that means is that they can add them, right? They can do what they're saying here where they can literally add the embeddings as opposed to concatenating them which is weird because again, this is actually misleading. So here this Z looks like it's bigger than this a. So it actually looks like this. If you were just looking at this, you would be like, Oh, the Z is 128 dimensional. And then I bet you this a is like 12 dimensional. Right. And because they're different dimensions, you can't add though. You can't add those vectors. So you concatenate them, which is what pretty much everybody did since the beginning of time. But in this one, for some reason, <laughs> I don't know what the reason was. Maybe it was like, they just happened to have code and they forgot to change this number and they ended up using the same dimensionality for the action model code book that they do for the video code book. And because they're the same dimension, that means you can add them. And then somehow when they add them, it actually improves the model, this, this entire thing. So that's kind of cool because like, this is like one of those little nuggets of knowledge where, you know, the best practice is this it's concatenation. And like, I can already hear it in my head how like, imagine if you came and you told someone, hey, we're going to add these. And they'd be like, that's stupid. Don't add them. Concatenate them because they're different. They're vectors that represent different things. You don't want to add those together. That's going to kind of like fudge it all and like make it fuzzy and it's going to get confused. Just concatenate or concatenate them and then you keep them separate, right? But the fact that they're adding them and that they got better results with that, you know, that's got me thinking about vision language models where you all, where you're also kind of doing this kind of concatenation type of mindset as opposed to adding them together. But I don't know. I thought that was kind of something, a little gem in this paper that's kind of easy to overlook, but that's actually kind of interesting. Yeah. 87, you, you do bring up a good point where it's like, maybe this really only works in this paper because it's a two dimensional platformer, right? It could be the case that in a more complicated situation, uh, where your your data distribution is much much more varied, much wider, this type of additive embedding is actually negative, right? So it could be the case that the video tokens that are coming out of here, 
or the video tokens that you end up learning, right? These 10, 10, 000, or these 1,024 uh, possible tokens that each are dimension 32, because they're trying to tokenize a video that is basically the same every time, except for this up, down, left, right, they have the same concept of up, down, left, right. So, I don't know, it could be that as well, right? It just, the, the weirdness of the problem is why this works, and maybe if you tried this on your own problem, it wouldn't work. But I don't know, I just thought that was kind of cool. Okay, so those are the three parts of the model. You have your dynamics model, you have your uh, action VQVAE, and you have your video VQVNE. And uh, Genie inference, so this is how they actually do inference. So when you're actually gonna use this, what, what are you gonna do? Well, what you're gonna do is you're gonna start with an image, X1, so this is an image that the user provides. That image gets encoded by the video tokenizer, right? The video tokenizer here consumes images or sequences of images and then gives you these tokens, right? These uh, video tokens here. So first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna turn the user image into a video token. Now you have a video token. Then you're gonna consume this action token and this action token is what the user is actually clicking. So you as the user, you're giving this model an image and then you're hitting the left arrow, right? So then you're telling it left arrow or right arrow or up arrow, right? And that, actually it's not, it's not even left arrow or right arrow. I think they're just picking one of these eight. So you see here how they say latent action 6676675527. They don't actually know what seven, six, five, five, or two are, right? They're basically just coming out of this VQVAE process where ultimately you're ending up with this code book of eight uh, possible action uh, tokens. But they don't know what it is, but they kind of really do know what it is because their thing is so limited that of course, one of these eight is gonna be the left and one of these eight is gonna be up and one of these eight is gonna be bottom or down. So it's kind of like you already really kind of know what that action space is. But anyways, then you feed that uh, video token, that action token into the dynamics model. The dynamics model can generate the next uh, video token. And then you just basically keep doing that over and over. And you can basically now play with your world. You can play in this uh, image, which is being kind of animated by this dynamics model, where the dynamics model is operating inside this discrete video token and action token space. And if you ever want to turn the uh, predicted frames, which is the Z hat T back into an image, you can then just feed it into the other half of this uh, video tokenizer, which is the decoder part and get back the images. And that's the uh, pipeline. Okay. Uh, repeat it to generate the rest of the sequence. Uh, what else? Okay, now we let's go into the experiment section a little bit here. Okay, so we trained Genie on a large scale data set co collected from publicly available internet videos of 2D platformer games. Again, this being a YouTube, or this being DeepMind, it's probably YouTube, although they might not even have, I think there are, I, I remember reinforcement learning papers that trained Atari from internet videos, so I bet you what they did is they probably just used that data set. Actually, Atari from YouTube. I remember when this came out. This was uh, Atari from YouTube reinforcement learning. Yeah, deep Q learning. I think it was after that. Playing Atari games, playing Atari games with deep reinforcement learning. It's going to be hard to find the specific paper, but there was a paper where they did this, where they basically trained Atari using YouTube videos. They, they didn't... They... They didn't train the whole thing. This is the first one to do it entirely unsupervised, but they trained their uh, V8, their this part of it with it. So similar to the uh, Schmidt Huber paper here, where you can train this encoder decoder VAE to compress your image space into a little latent. But then, when you actually want to train the dynamics model, which in this paper in the in the Schmidt Huber paper is an RNN, you do need these A's, AFTs, right? So this is the, the main difference between the Genie paper and the previous papers is that you have these AFTs here. These are explicit ATs, right? So you need those to be labeled versus in this Genie paper, you're kind of creating those ATs by doing this VQVAE. Okay. 
So that's 55 million 16 second video clips at 10 frames per second, 160 by 90 resolution, which is quite small. Uh, and then they filter it down to 6.8 million 16 second video clips with their uh, binary classifier. Uh, they're also going to show this on the robotics data just to show that it's a little bit more general. But again, I feel like the robotics data also has this up, down, left, right situation. So it's kind of a little bit more similar than they think it is. Uh, this, let's go into my rant. So here's another rant for you guys. All right, so if you're a longtime enjoyer of the channel, you've definitely heard me rant about Frechet inception distance before. So I don't like this metric. And in this uh, paper, they're gonna be using Frechet video distance. So in order to determine the quality of video generation, the gold standard is that you basically have human evaluation on video quality. So you want humans to sit there and look at a video and tell you whether it's good or bad. But human evaluation is expensive, right? You have to pay for people to sit there. Nobody has time to do that. So people have come up with these kind of approximate metrics, right? Which is a metric that you can compute without a human that is supposed to track. So it has a high level of alignment to human evaluation on video quality. So what that means is that if you have a very high, for shit, if, if your for shit video distance is telling you this is shit, more often than not, the human evaluators are also saying this is shit, but the nuance is lost. And that's why I don't like this for shit video distance. And maybe just to motivate that a little bit more, here's an image of basically uh, showing how for shit inception distance changes as you change an image. So for example here, this image compared to this image, this is the distance between them, right? This image compared to this image, this is the distance between them. And maybe what does distance mean? So in this case, what Frechet inception distance is doing is it's doing the distance between the deepest layer of an inception V3. So what they're doing is they're taking an inception V3, which is a paper from 2015 right? It's an inception architecture. This is a really old architecture that's been trained on a very kind of primitive, like 2012 data set. And then they're going to the very, very last layer of this architecture. And that's going to be some vector. And then they're saying, okay, what is the L2 difference, aka the L2 distance between the vector that I get when I feed in image A and the vector that I get when I feed in image B? Right, so it it does kind of work, but it's like it's weird, right? It's like it, you're 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 looking at the L two distance in the final layer of a 2015 transformer or 2015 ConvNet based model. So it's like it's just so like why are we still doing that? You know, it's like can we use something like the even even just the distance in like the clip space would be so much more meaningful. Right? I think there's so many other more modern, more foundational kind of image uh, representation spaces where you could take an L2 distance and it would have so much more meaning, but nobody wants to rewrite this code. Nobody wants to like go back and try to change things because the convenience about having a kind of metric like this that you can use time and time again is that you can then compare to previous papers and nobody has to change the evaluation code. But I feel like it's time that we update this FID because just look at this type of weird shit. So here, this blurry image and this blurry image have a much uh, less distance than this one here. So you can see how some things cause m much more of a distance in this inception latent space than other things. So is this image compared to this image where like you completely warp her face, is that more or less far away than this image and this image? Because for Shea inception distance says that this compared to this is way worse than this compared to this. Right, so it's 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 just a little bit weird, a little bit arbitrary, and it's based on this kind of ancient uh, model architecture that nobody even uses anymore. So that's where my uh, beef with Frechet inception distance, and then the video equivalent of it, which is Frechet video distance, uh, comes from. Okay, they're also going to use their own kind of like peak signal to noise ratio PSNR uh, variant here, but. Yeah, TLDR, just take the, the numbers here with a little grain of salt because they're not truly indicative of quality. Uh, okay, our video tokenizer uses 200 million parameters, a patch size of four. So the patch size of four tells you uh, basically 
the this and well, let me see if I can find it here. So this would be a, a you see how here it's being broken up into these patches. So the patch size is how many of those patches are you breaking it up? So here the patch size of 4 compared to the patch size of 16 it's the 16 is more high resolution than the video tokenizer and that makes sense because the action model right you kind of need to look at a much smaller part of the frame right it's like the the action model you you probably need to know what is the actual little like player and what is the background so you probably need to have a much higher resolution on the patches compared to the uh video model which you know the whole it's just trying to reconstruct the whole frame so like you don't need to have that level of resolution that's kind of my i guess my hand wavy argument as to why you can have a much smaller patch size in the video tokenizer uh, same embedding size for both the video tokenizer and the action model, which is why they can do this additive embedding, right? So embedding size 32 for the video and embedding size 32 for the action. The video tokenizer has a larger code book of 1024. Action model has eight size code book. And this is again where I'm saying that, hey, you got rid of the fact that you have to annotate frames with actions, but you're just kind of pushing that inductive bias into the fact that you're hard coding this eight unique codes there so little sketch for all modeling components we use a sequence length of 16 frames with an fps of 10 temperature of 2 mm, what else okay then they do some scaling so they try it with different size models so here's uh, the scaling results aka figure 9 training curves and final training losses. So you can see here the big model, 2.7 billion parameters versus 41 billion parameters. The loss is kind of uh, indicative of higher is worse, lower is better. And of course it makes sense. The little tiny model doesn't do quite as good as the big model. And you kind of see a nice gracefully uh, scale. Grace, how do they describe it? scales gracefully with model parameters with each increase in size corresponding to a consistent decrease in the final training loss this is a strong benefit strong indication that our approach benefits from scaling which kind of is a no-brainer you know i feel like anyone could have come up with that but make your models bigger they're better capable of capturing what's in there uh we also investigate the effect of scaling batch size, considering uh, different batch sizes, 128, 256, 448. So whenever they're training these models, the batch size is basically how many examples they're giving it at one time. So the way that deep learning works is you're pushing a gradient based on a loss, right? And the loss is calculated for a mini batch. So you're not calculating the loss for each image, right? It's not like you're feeding in one at a time and then pushing gradients for one thing at a time. You're usually pushing gradients for a batch of things. Usually the size of the batch is not, it, bigger is like generally almost always better. And one way to think about why it's better is that when you are feeding in a very small sample or just like think about a batch size of one, the gradient or the direction that you're going to be moving right that little marble in the lost landscape is going to be a little bit more random right because each image might okay you might move this way and then the other image makes you move that way and then the other image makes you move that way so you're kind of the the steps that you're taking in this lost landscape are more random so it kind of takes forever to get to the point that you want right as you make the batch size bigger and bigger and bigger the the kind of steps that you're taking are almost they're, they're kind of more in the direction that you want right but people don't pick the batch size because they're thinking about that. People pick the batch size based on their computer, right? So it's, it's like the batch size is almost more just determined by what you're running this on, right? So if you have 10 GPUs, you're going to pick the batch size that fits on 10 GPUs. If you have 100 GPUs, you're going to pick a bigger batch size because it fits on 100 GPUs, right? So it's like the batch size is limited based on your hardware, not necessarily the choice that you're coming up beforehand. So in this case, because it's Google DeepMind, they can pick the batch size because they can just get more GPUs if they really want or TPUs, but uh, increasing the batch size leads to similarly favorable gain in terms of model performance. The bigger the model, the bigger the batch size, the better your result. 
The batch size of 512 for a total of 125k steps. So 512 or 125,000 steps, 125,000 times you're sampling a batch of 512, putting that through the loss, getting the gradient, taking a step, changing the weights, getting another batch, and so on. They use a 256 TPU V5P. And one thing that's weird about this paper is they actually like, so they kind of change the hardware time. So like here in that section, they said they use a TPU V5P, but then here they say that they use a TPU V2 and a TPU V3. And then if you scroll here, they say they use 64 TPU V3s, 128 TPU V3s, and then 64 TPU V5Ps. So I'm not actually sure what the fuck they used, right? Like they, they, they mentioned three different things here. So 256 TPU V5s, and then here they're saying, okay, well, actually, a bunch of them are actually TPU V3. So not entirely sure what they used to train this, but uh, here's a screenshot from a talk that Jeff Dean, who is kind of like a high-ranking uh, AI, he's kind of more of a computer science type person, more than like an AI person, but the man definitely knows uh, his uh, distributed TPU training stuff, and in this slide, he's showing the latest generation of TPU, so TPU V5E and then V5P. So you can just he see here the difference between those and chips per pod. So that's also another weird thing is that the V5Ps have 8,000 or almost 9,000 chips per pod. The pod, you could think of it like the, the kind of like the rack, like the server rack, even though it's actually, it's not necessarily all in one rack, but 256 TPUs in one rack or one pod. So what are they doing here, right? Because 256 TPU V5Ps doesn't correspond to what's going on here, right? If you're using 256, that's making, that's making me think you're using a V5E pod. And then later on, you're now telling me that actually it's not TPU V5s, it's actually a TPU V3, but two different size pods of TPU V3, so kind of confusing i don't know if this is done on purpose i don't know if this is like a they purposefully kind of obfuscated so you don't really know what the fuck they're running it on or it could be the type of situation where the people that were actually doing the like uh experiments don't really know what they're running on right so that there's someone else some other google employee who's the person who actually does all the like tpu stuff and they're just saying hey here's what i want to train here's the data set here's the the model architecture blah 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 and then you figure it out so I don't know what this is indicative of the fact that they they're kind of like all over the place here trying to describe what they train it on. It's not consistent. So does anybody really know what they train on at Google? Maybe is the question. A uh, question from Pratush. So higher batch size cancels the individual sample noise. That's the argument I use. Uh, the paper I would recommend is don't increase the batch size increase. Uh, Let's see. Yeah, this one. So this is a kind of a classic paper. If you're interested in kind of a more formal and like uh, complete theoretical intuition as to why batch size is uh, better, bigger batch size is better, I would read this paper. But my kind of like simple intuitive explanation that I keep in my head is that the bigger the batch size, the more kind of like in the right direction each individual step is. That's kind of my shitty intuition on it, but I would recommend this paper if you want a more fleshed out definition. Okay. Uh, for our website, we train a larger decoder mapping tokens to 360p videos, adding additional parameters. So again, it's important to note that in this paper, the video size is actually really small. It's like 160 by 90, yeah, 160 by 90 resolution. So actually when you're going here and you're looking at these images, these are not actually the actual final image size. So they actually got the results with a much smaller, tiny, even grainier and shittier images. And then they made these a little bit bigger so that it looks more impressive. Uh, 
the ability to generalize to or the ability to generalize to such significantly OOD output inputs underscores the robustness of our approach. This is uh, a little bit, as I said before, a little bit disingenuous. You know, like here's the real world images. So real world images are out of distribution. So what they're basically saying is that hey, if you were to feed an image into this, right? this image x1 that is entirely out of distribution, such as this. Then what happens, right? Does our dynamics model, does our uh, world model that converts this into a video into video tokens and then does our dynamics model work? And they're saying, oh, it works. So therefore this is proof that what we did is general, right? But is it really, you know, like how out of distribution is this? doesn't really seem out of distribution to me. It kind of looks like you have a two-dimensional thing with a with where the horizon is oriented and flat. You have a single kind of player character type of, type of thing. So it, it's not really out of distribution. You know, these are in distribution. This is probably the only one that is out of distribution. And then even this one is kind of not really out of distribution. Okay. Uh, platformer trained models. They do this with the robots. It can understand 3D scenes and emulate parallax. Eh, again, I would kind of take fault with that. Like, is it doing any, is this understanding the 3D scene right here? Does it feel like it understands what this guy is or does it feel like it just overrid it? You know, it kind of looks like it, I don't know. doesn't really look like a high level of understanding there to me. Uh, they train on the robots taking the same latent action five times. So here you have the original image and then you basically just go down, 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 down. And then that's what it looks like. This is kind of a little bit more impressive, I guess, but it's trained separately on the robotics data set. So it would have been pretty badass if they were able to generalize to this robotics data given the original model, which is trained on the platformers, but that's not the case. They trained a separate one on uh the robots and then the the robot one is able to do that as is able to kind of predict for robots but it, i think that they probably wish it would have worked with the uh original 2d platformer one so training two separate ones is not necessarily indicative of this kind of transfer or generalization claim that they're making uh, presents a path to using larger video data sets to create a foundational world model for robotics. We believe Genie could one day be used as a foundation world model for training generalist agents. Probably. I bet you a lot of these ideas are going to be uh, in whatever the, whatever the actual true foundation world model is. But I don't think these ideas are original to this paper. I think a lot of these ideas come from the Schmidt-Huber paper. And then even these ideas in the Schmidt-Huber paper come from even earlier papers. So claiming that like, hey, everyone's going to be using genie models. It's like you just, there's no, there's nothing necessarily original here. You're just kind of taking Schmidt-Huber's world model paper. You're using spatial temporal transformers and VQVAEs. And then it's basically the same thing. So, Okay. Uh, the frozen lamb to label a sequence of expert videos. The lamb is the latent action model. So they're basically feeding a sequence of expert videos. Someone playing some kind of Atari game into this lamb. The lamb is able to basically infer or create here. Are the Here's the discrete latent actions that are in between every single frame. And much like the Schmidt-Huber paper, they just train some behavior cloning on top of that. Behavior cloning is a very simple type of reinforcement learning where you're basically trying to mimic what an expert human is doing. So you can look at what an expert human is doing here and you can say, okay, at this particular frame, the human took this action. At this particular frame, the human took this action. At this particular frame, the human took this action. And previously when you were training behavior cloning, you would train it in almost like a supervised way where you're saying, okay, here's the frame and then the answer should be this action. And then here's the frame and the answer should be this action. But the magic of these world models is that given a frame, they'll give you the action. So now you no longer need an annotated action for every single frame. You can basically say, okay, I have a video of someone controlling or playing this Atari game. I'm going to first feed it through my world model or this, this uh, genie. It's going to give me the action at every single one of those. And now I have a 
supervised learning data set that I can use for behavior cloning because now for every single one of those frames, I also have an action and now I can basically just train behavior cloning on that. And that leads to the most beautiful sentence, right? The, once you have that, then you can eventually train a reinforcement learning agent entirely inside of its own hallucinated dream. And that's it. What else? Design choices. Alternative using tokenized images. What else? Some information about video dynamics and movements might have been lost. Spatial only VIT, sp spatial temporal VIT, and CVIT. So they try a couple different types of vision transformers that allow for the uh, time dimension to be accounted for as well. So the one that they use, again, has that little trick where they only consider uh, temporal attention within a specific token and then spatial attention within a specific frame. So by doing that, this particular instantiation or flavor of a transformer is linear with the number of frames rather than quadratic, but that's not really a flex because it would probably work better if you had full attention between every single token in every single frame, but it would just be prohibitively memory intensive. So therefore they had to use that little hack or at least use this particular one. Here's the Schmidt Huber reference. Dropping inductive biases in exchange for a general method did they really drop the inductive bias though? I think they just l constrained the data set distribution such that in that cons that level of constraint is in itself a type of inductive bias. Uh, our setting, the levels can be learned and generated directly from pixels. So here what they're saying is that they tried, uh, here you see how the dynamics model, it's working in the space of uh, these video tokens. So they said, okay, well, what if instead of video tokens, we just learn directly in an image space or pixel space? And that's one of the ablations that they do here. Of course, it's not going to necessarily work as well. So pixel input versus token input. You get slightly better FVD with token input, slightly worse PSNR. Interesting. So I don't know, maybe you don't need this token video tokenizer but my argument would be that like these metrics are kind of meaningless so what does two extra points on for video distance even mean right and yeah, maybe you don't need this tokenizer at all look at that that's actually great what does a difference of 100 on fvd mean well, this is FID, so I can't even use this to look at FVD. FVD, a 100 difference in FID is this. What does a 100 difference in FVD mean? I don't know, probably something like that as well. Okay. Uh, we can use latent actions alert from in internet videos to infer policies for arbitrary environments, avoiding the need for ground truth actions that are costly and may not generalize. Again, if you're limiting your environments such that every single one of them is a 2D platformer. The latent action space that you learn is kind of just, it, of course, it's going to be the <laughs> very easy to learn. Uh, we propose Genie, a new form of generative AI that enables anyone, even children, to dream up, create, and step into generated worlds as we can with human design simulated environments. This was this even children here. So what they're referencing is that in the acknowledgement section here, uh, first of all, they mentioned that they use Jax. So... Even the people at Google don't use TensorFlow. Everyone just uses Jax now. But they uh, dox Jeff Kloon's kids. So Jeff Kloon, this guy here, he's known. You know, he does a bunch of this type of uh, world model, reinforcement learning type stuff. He's definitely well known in this world, but these are apparently his kids. So kind of sketchy that, <laughs> that, they, that they dox his kids <laughs> in this paper. But there you go. That's the name of his children. Um, limited to 16 frames of memory. Pretty small. Genie currently operates around 1 FPS. The 1 FPS is uh, in this way. So if you were to do this, it takes. You can only do one frame per second, which makes sense because you have to basically feed 
uh, you first have to encode your image, then you have to go through this dynamics model, and then every time you want to look at the output, you can't look at this because this is just some video token. You actually have to feed it through the decoder. So the inference time of this combined with the inference time of this means that you can really only run this demo at one frame per second, which is pretty slow, but I think that's fine. Uh... Training data and weights. We have chosen not to release the trained model checkpoints, the model's training data set, or examples from that data. Fuck that. That's just this closed AI mindset. But they do something weird, which is uh, they actually release uh, a simple version of this. We understand it may be challenging for researchers with few computational to reproduce our main results. Nobody's got 256 TPU uh, a 256 TPU pod sitting around, right? We don't have that type of compute. So in order to mitigate this issue, we describe a smaller scale, fully reproducible example in Appendix F that can be run on a mid-range TPU. Huh. So many design choices translate between the two settings. So this is, a lot of people do this now, right? Where basically you can't run hyperparameter sweeps in large model trainings, right? So normally when you're doing research, you're going to have to sweep through all the different hyperparameters, right? The hyperparameters are like these kind of things here, right? So the dimensionality of the model, the number of heads, like the code book size, the latent dimension size, right? You don't actually know the answer to these things right away. You have to sweep over possible different values and then see which one performs better. But sweeping over a variety of these values can be very expensive, right? Because for each individual permutation, you basically have to tr train the whole thing. So what a lot of people do is that they uh, basically sweep over hyperparameters with smaller size models and then uh, just assume and or extrapolate and say that, okay, if this is the settings that we had for the small models that worked well, we're just going to pray and hope that the same settings with a bigger model will also work the best. So rather than giving you the full final trained model checkpoints and the full final data set, they're gonna instead say, hey, here's the little toy version of the data set, the toy uh, model that was trained on a single TPU, which is probably what the people who actually did this work, they, they were doing it in like single GPUs. And then they probably just said, okay, here, we're going to take everything that we did and we're going to hand it off to this other guy over there who knows his way around TPU pods. And then he's going to train the big boy version of it. So that's kind of my guess as to what's happening here, but it's interesting that they'll re they're going to release the like kind of small didactic example version of this, which they probably used to tune the hyperparameters, but they're not going to release the big boy version of this. Which I guess is better than not releasing anything, but I don't know, that's also like like kind of the first time I've seen that, so maybe that's kind of the standard. Maybe as we move into the future, what we'll get, we'll get little toy versions, and then the big boy versions will be secret. So I don't know, maybe this is indicative of what we'll see in the future. Isn't it called a warm-up stage? Uh, I think warm-up is a little bit different. I think warm-up is more about getting the momentum terms and the learning rate scheduling nice before you start pushing gradients, but I don't know, maybe you're right. They use jacks. Jeff Kloon worked on this. What else? Is there anything else on this? More effective to scale our decoder than our encoder. Little interesting little tidbit there for you guys that are interested. Adam W. Optimizer with cosine DK. TPU V2, TPU V3. This is like the weirdness where it's not entirely sure what they trained on. Here's your uh, policy, which you would train using this world model, your policy consumes a state XT, which in this case is going to be a uh, video tokens, and then it outputs actions, which is going to be one of the eight latent actions. We describe a self-contained, fully reproducible case study. This is the little tiny version of it. 
that's pretty much it, guys. Let me see. Do I have anything else here for you guys? I have the Schmidt Huber world model, which uses an RNN. I have the VQVAE paper. I have this visualization of a VQ vector quantization. I have your standard VAE. I have this spatial temporal transformer paper. I have VITs. I have the slide describing what a V5 TPU is. I have this describing the Frechet inception distance, masking, and then this paper. Okay, I think I pretty much went over everything that I wanted to go over. Let me sip some coffee. You guys put some questions on there so that I can ask or answer your questions, and then we will summarize this paper, summarize this stream. Uh, okay. So question from Pritom, what's ablation? So an ablation study is when you basically try different parts of the model. So like any kind of research paper like this is going to basically consist of multiple different parts, right? So in this case, you have a video tokenizer, which you're training separately, and then you train this latent action model. And like for any one of these different things, there's a bunch of different design choices that you made. And when you're performing an ablation, what you're doing is you're basically trying uh, with that design choice without that design choice. So like anytime you could have done something different, you see what the difference was, right? So the kind of one that they do here is they say, okay, well, instead of token input, what if we would have used uh, done this in pure pixel space, right? So this is an ablation between token input and pixel input. So they're basically saying which one of these was better because we kind of arbitrarily chose tokens, but we don't know if that was the right design choice. So we're going to perform an ablation to pick and see the difference, right? So that's what an ablation is. Uh, and then question from Tim, curious your thoughts on the top five AI topics to cover for a general 30 minute keynote audience. I think it depends on your audience. There's so many different things you could talk about. What's your What's your audience, Timothy Stewart? Because you could talk about agents. You could talk about transformers. You know, you could talk about hardware. You could talk about the politics. You know, the 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 market landscape. Like, depends on like. Do you want to go super deep? Is this a deep technical audience? Is this a kind of a, like a layman normie audience. It's going to matter. Technical audience applications. Yeah, so in that case, I feel like you probably want to talk about agents. You probably want to talk a little bit about robots, how those agents can be used with robots, self-operating computers. You could talk about kind of uh, inference and this, how people are kind of using quantization to make models smaller. You know, you could talk about how inference is also you're starting to see these chips that are specifically for inference. So we're starting to separate the kind of training process and the inference process. I don't know. You could talk about different modalities, right? So video, text, you're now starting to see more exotic modalities like audio, you know, potentially touch, other things like that. What if they used Sora for this world instead of a 2D platform gaming stuff? Yeah, so Sora is basically a better version of this. Sora is a very, very good video tokenizer, this right here. So the video tokenizer of Sora is guaranteed way better than this video tokenizer, right? This video tokenizer is a VQVAE that is trained with a relatively small vocabulary, and each of those words in the vocabulary, each of those codes is a relatively small dimensional vector, right, of 32. So whatever video tokenizer that they used in Sora is trained on way, like probably a hundred X or a thousand X more data. It's also significantly bigger and the uh, space of tokens is also bigger and the dimensionality of those tokens are bigger. So like literally every part of this is bigger in uh, Sora. The, the latent action model like this is kind of more where it would be confused where i think like that is 
something that I would want to see experiments, right? Because it's like, can you, the, the, the latent action model, it works here because of how constrained this data set is, right? So the reason you're able to get like reasonable, a reasonable code book of latent actions is because you're filtering this data set so heavily for these types of 2D things, right? So it's so filtered and all of those things have such a similar action space that you can get something that isn't nonsense when you're doing this latent action model. But if you were to feed the entire internet and try to do this kind of like, oh, we're just going to infer the actions in between them, I think it's, I don't know if you, I don't know if what you would get make, would make any sense, you know, because I think that the action space of the real world is like way more diverse and weird and complicated than the action space of these two-dimensional platformers. It could be the type of thing where it just kind of like solves itself, you know, like maybe if you, if you make this a hundred times bigger and feed it with a thousand times more data, it just solves itself, you know, <laughs> and then the model will just figure out some magical, like 30,000 vocabulary, uh, action space that encompasses every single possible thing you could do in a video, but we won't know until someone does that. So we're just going to kind of wait until someone takes this, uh, genie paper and then throws 10 times the amount of compute at it, which isn't going to happen necessarily super soon, right? Cause this, this paper itself is 10 times the amount of compute, right? As they mentioned, this is, uh, it's challenging for researchers with fewer computational resources to reproduce our main results, right? Like the thing that they actually train this on, like this 256 pod TPU or 256 TPU V5P pod, this thing is millions of dollars, right? I, I don't know what the final price is here, right? For this thing, but you don't have that. So the, the group of people that can actually extend this work is, is like three companies. It's like NVIDIA, maybe Meta, maybe Google and OpenAI, and that's it. Like no one else can take this work and put another 10 X scale into it. So we're just going to have to wait for probably Jim fan. I bet you Jim fan is doing some version of this with his new group. Cause he has a new, like uh, he got a bunch of money recently to basically have a group inside open inside NVIDIA that kind of has carte blanche in terms of like GPU budget to train this type of shit. So I almost guarantee you that he's probably going to do something similar to this paper. And then that would probably come out towards the end of this year. So that would be my guess. Uh, how do you think about and help identify the best use cases to apply AI short term and midterm with the speed things are moving? Uh, it's a really hard question, man. Nobody really knows, you know, you're kind of trying to predict the future and the future is getting harder and harder to predict because this is the first time in human history that we're on this type of ramp, right? At no other point in human history have we been on this level of a technological kind of like exponential curve, you know? For most of human history, you could take what happened in the past 100 years and kind of like reasonably extrapolate what's going to happen over the next 100 years. But that stopped being a good... You, you can't even do that anymore, right? I feel like since the 2010s, it's like it's very, very difficult, basically impossible to predict what's going to happen over the next 10 years, let alone the next five years and then two years and then one year. So nobody really knows. You just kind of, it's like drinking from a higher fire hose, but you know, everybody else is also drinking from a fire hose. So that's all you got to do. What do you think about the impact of world models on robotics and its future? I think you're definitely going to use them. I think you're going to be training these robots in simulation and these simulations are going to go from being kind of more explicit type of simulations like we have now, like a Unreal Engine or these Mujoko kind of simulators where you're kind of very explicitly calculating everything based on these Newtonian uh, laws. You know, I think we're going to move away from that and we're going to probably move to training uh, these embodied agents such as robots and autonomous vehicles inside these world models that are basically just hallucinating the next uh, step given a certain action. So we're probably going to do that, but I think these world models need to get a little bit more performant before you can start training on them. Should we still be learning CUDA? I don't necessarily think so. So I think if the... <laughs> Even even uh, this guy, right? J uh, not even Jim Fan, but Jensen Huang. I think he came out recently, and he's like, "We shouldn't be telling kids to learn to code anymore." 
So if the founder of NVIDIA is telling you it's not worth learning how to code, you know, I, eh, I think it's important to know like the abstraction. So like, I think there will still be people that code, but it's like the, the way that you code will change. It's like, you won't actually need to be like, sit there, like l writing this kind of like leak code stuff anymore. Right. You don't actually need to make sure that you can code well enough to like write the specific functions, write these specific operations. But as long as you have good fundamentals around like data structures and like things that are sequential versus things that are done in parallel, right? Like those are the abstractions that really matter, right? So I would say get good at those abstractions rather than necessarily like going to the like CUDA API, like CUDA like documentation and like knowing what the specific different little things in the CUDA document, like that's, that's worthless. But having a good understanding of the different abstractions and like parallel versus sequential and like, what inference is, what training is, what sharding is, like those general high level ideas, those will be useful. Uh, thanks for the 10, Joseph. I appreciate it. What about learning math for ML deep learning? You can, you know, I think the math is, is fun. You know, to me, it's like, it's the more beautiful part of it and it's the timeless part of it. So I'm, my view is that it doesn't matter what you do, right? I don't think, I think that you could literally sit in your apartment and stare at a wall and the world will become a, like a utopia. So it's like, regardless of what actions you take in your life, you're still going to be in a VR utopia 10 years from now. So when you, people say, Hey, does it, do I need to do X? You don't need to do anything. You could just sit in your chair and just wait for it to happen. So do you need to learn machine learning and deep learning math? No, but if you're interested in it and you learn it, maybe you'll get the opportunity to kind of work on it. And if you get the opportunity to work on it, maybe that makes you feel better about yourself like 10, 20 years down the line. Cause you're like, Hey, I contributed a little bit to this AGI, but I don't think you need to do anything because regardless of whether you help or not, we're already there. Nothing can stop it at this point. Okay. Just stay alive. That's all you got to do. Basically. <laughs> Just make sure you're sleeping well, you get your, you're working out, you know, like that's what matters, but you don't actually need to do anything. All right. I think I'm just kind of like riffing on riffs at this point. So I'm going to go back here and summarize what we did on the stream and we'll go from there. All right. So today we uh, did a stream on the genie world model. So I called it the genie world model because even though this is a paper that came out recently in 2024 and they call it a generative interactive environment, really what this paper is, is a world model. And the world model comes from a Schmidt-Huber paper where basically a world model is something that can compress a the world into a low dimensional representation, this Z here, right? So you're creating these encoder decoders that through reconstruction losses basically learn how to compress all the information into this little tiny vector Z, right? Which is much lower dimensional than an image. This little tiny vector Z in the original world model paper by Schmidt Huber is done using a standard VAE, which has a continuous latent space you see there. So there's basically infinite values that it can take in this genie paper. They don't do that. They instead use what is known as a VQVAE. The VQVAE comes from this paper called Neural Discrete, where the discrete is the keyword there, right? So rather than having a continuous space like this, continuous latent space, a VQVAE learns basically a code book. It, it has a discretized latent space. So this shows you how basically an infinite space of whatever this is, two-dimensional latent space here, can be turned into uh, one of 10 vectors or nine clusters here. So basically you discretized this infinite space here into 10 possible clusters. And uh, that's what they're going to be doing here. Basically they're going to be training VQVAEs for a uh, video tokenizer and a latent action model. So they're basically going to compress images into these representations or in this case, it's not even images that we're talking videos, right? Into these representations, the video tokenizer, this is telling you what is in the image basically, or what is in the video. 
And then the latent action model is trying to basically tell you the action that was taken at the last step. So this latent action model consumes all the frames or all the image frames up until the very last frame and then the very last frame. And then it says, okay, what's the action at time step T, which is the action that takes you from XT to XT plus one. Also with the VQVAE. For, damn dude, my brain is just like not working right now, but both the video tokenizer and this latent action model make use of a spatial temporal transformer. So in the original Schmidt Huber paper, he uses a uh, convnet for this uh, VAE, and then he uses a recurrent neural network for the actual dynamics model. In this genie paper, they use a ST transformer for the latent action model in the video tokenizer, which is just kind of like a more modern, you could think of it like a vision transformer that includes the time dimension, and that is a more modern compared to the convnet. And for the dynamics model here, they use this decoder-only mask GIT. The D dynamics model is kind of like the recurrent neural network here, but the difference here is that uh, the, actually there isn't a difference there. The dynamics model is consuming video tokens and action tokens, and it's predicting the next video token. So it's basically, here's the current state of the world up until time step T minus one. Here's the actions I took up until time step T minus one. And then here's the next state, the next image, right? The next frame. But the magic of this is that normally in order to train this dynamics model, you would need a data set of this. You would need a data set of basically state transitions with the action in between. So you would basically need a data set of like frame A, frame B, and then the action I took in between. But the magic in this paper is that you don't need to do that because you just trained this thing here. So because you trained this latent action model, you can just feed it two frames or a sequence of frames and it'll tell you that action. It won't it doesn't know it, but it's going to guess at it. And then that's what you're feeding into your dynamics model. So basically, because you trained this latent action model, you can now feed an image into this latent action model or a video, and it'll give you the actions. And then now you can actually train a dynamics model. So, okay. What else? I completely bungled this this summary i'm all over the place like this stream but what else they train all of these using a data set that they scrape from the internet so they train this on a data set they they probably filter from youtube it's basically 500 or 55 million videos of 2d platformers the data set is of poor quality, which means that a lot of the data set contains weird frames such as menu screens or the faces of streamers in the corner, right? So in order to filter this data set, they filter it aggressively using a binary classifier, which they train using hand-labeled videos. So they basically go through and they say, this video is bad, this video is good, this video is bad, this video is good. And then they train a classifier with that and then they use that to filter their data set. And this filtered data set is, I think, the weakest part of this uh, entire paper. So the this paper's good. The, the ablation studies are good. The explanations are good. I really like the figures. The figures are very clean. You know, they're, they're compelling. The writing is good. There's a lot of good things about this paper, but the one thing that I don't like about this paper is the, the claims that they're making, right? So they're calling this a foundation world model, right? They're saying that, oh, this thing, um, uh, let me see the exact thing here. Uh, generated dropping inductive biases uh, in exchange for a general method, right? Like this works in out of distribution environments, right? They keep saying like this thing works with anything. It's a it's a world model, but um, that's not actually true, right? It's a very very constrained uh, data set and a very very constrained part of the entire world, right? Two dimensional platformers represent a very very tiny part of a true foundation world model. So at some point, someone's gonna make a, a big boy version of this that is actually a true foundational world model. And in that case, it'll it'll have a much larger variety of data versus this is a much very narrow kind of toy example. Uh, and I think the best kind of proof for that is that if you look at the action model, which looks at frame sequences of frames and then gives you the actions, right? 
the number of code books or the size of the code book of that action model is eight. So this is basically an inductive bias here is that because your data set is so limited to these two dimensional platformers, your latent action model effectively spits back out at you the fact that your entire data set can be explained with up arrow, down arrow, left arrow, right arrow jump. So that's a very strong bias there. I don't know. That's, that's the part I don't like is that they kind of pretend that this is a foundation world model when really it's a very narrow kind of world model. But I think it's a refreshing modern take on basically Schmidt Huber's paper. They're basically just taking Schmidt Huber's paper using modern architectures, training slightly more, and then getting rid of this uh, requirement of needing an action. So they, they don't need this action. But then other than that, it's basically the same paper, just the more modern version of it. I don't know. That was a terrible explanation. I feel like this wasn't necessarily my greatest stream, but hopefully it was entertaining. And I can't wait until uh, Jim Fan makes the 10x version of this because he's probably going to do that. So we'll see what happens when that comes out. <laughs> All right, guys. I don't know. I don't know what else to do. That's pretty much it. Interesting paper, but a little bit too toy. Just got to wait till the end of this year for someone to release a, a bigger version of this or even just a robotic specific version of this, like even a version of this that was uh, trained on robotics data entirely. They do a little bit of robotics data training here, but the data set that they use is actually quite old. They use an RT, the RT1 data set, which is, there's RT2 and then there's RTX. So there's even more modern versions of this. So I want to see what happens when you train a much bigger version of this on a much more varied distribution and then see what we get. But uh, I think I'm going to close it off with this Schmidt Huber quote here, which I think is the coolest one is we want to train agents entirely inside of its own hallucinated dream generated by a world model, which I think is basically what a human life is, is your, your life is a dream and you're training your soul. I'm going to end on that. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks. Thanks for watching. Hope this was a little bit useful. Hope it was entertaining. I don't know. If you guys have any more questions, drop by the Discord. Thanks, Joseph, Spyro, Pritom, Timothy, Majetti, 87. Uh, who else? More. You guys are very active here. Same people talking. Jay, 87. Raphael, Khalil, uh, Vishnu, Jay, more Jay, Ed, Umang, 2ARX, and the big Fortuno. Thanks, everybody. Hope you had a great time. See you tomorrow.